Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. A week ago, I was at the Industry Summit in Las Vegas. I did a fun panel with Adam Martin of Dave and Adams and Rob Veris of Burbank about content creation and what it was in the day and how it is now and how we've all adapted to the new realities of technology. Thanks, sponsors, Tops Panini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Compsy.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. At the Industry Summit, it was heavy on retailers, local card shops, as well as digital uh, online sellers of cards, a heavy presence of fanatics, and lots of others there. I was only there for a day because, as you know, my wonderful wife's birthday was the following day. So I did my thing and then jumped on a plane and got back in time to celebrate. And here is an abridgment of the remarks that I made. They asked me to do a TED Talk. So here it is for your listening pleasure, and I'll be back again tomorrow. We'll talk about the hobby. Actually, I'm big on saying that it's still a hobby, but it's also an industry. For some people, it's both. But if you're an industry person, which means probably you're full time, don't criticize the people that think it's a hobby. It's still a hobby and a business. It's an industry, but there's hobby roots. The other point I want to leave you with is there's a book that was written. It's called Co-Opetition. And basically, it talks about how you could compete, but you could also cooperate. I think that's what needs to happen in this industry. You're thinking, well, wait, do I compete first and then cooperate? <laughs> or do I cooperate and then when the going gets tough, I compete? Both are required. We want to grow the pie. And as Rob said, we'd like to get a bigger slice of that pie as well. I consume a lot of hobby content and I always have. There are people that had publications back in the 60s or 70s and I was a subscriber. Nowadays, you can get everything you want pretty much online. I listen to lots of other podcasts. I, I think I listened to all of them that were out there a few years ago, but now there's too many to listen to. But one of the ones I've listened to that's quite prolific, the Luca Nation Network with Andrew and Cage. And in their network, they have Brian from Cajun Cardboard. And he had an episode about six weeks ago. If you could ask the genie for anything to change in this hobby, what would it be? Got some great responses. But you know what? You ought to think, I shouldn't be looking for a genie to bail me out. I'm in this industry, I'm in this hobby, and there are things that I can change. 50 years ago, almost, I think I didn't realize how much influence I could have over a fledgling hobby slash industry. But I got started, and things grew, and the same thing can be true for you. Not necessarily in an authoring and publishing way, but we can have more influence than we think. Everybody in this room is an influencer. Also, newsflash, there are no such thing as genies. But if the genie was omniscient as well, they'd say, you know, Jim, you shouldn't be wishing for that. I could do that for you, but it's not a good idea. It's not going to end the way you think. And there's certainly things that people in the industry think should happen, but it wouldn't be good if they did happen. So I'll give you a few examples here. Taken from this podcast episode, one was... The PSA 10 should not be the standard. Now here I am, I'm the B in BGS. I was instrumental, obviously, in founding that. And if I were the genie, I'd love for BGS to be the standard. But BGS 9.5, Gem Mint, doesn't have the same ring as PSA 10, Gem Mint. And now who wants a nine? It's only mint. So there has to be a standard I'd love for BGS to be the standard, but PSA earned the standard. They didn't just accidentally become the standard. They've earned it. They were doing great before Nat Turner got there, and they're doing even better now. And there were also complaints. Genie, can you make PSA lower their prices? Can you make them take away their upcharge? Well, everyone in this room that either bulk submits or submits to PSA or any of the other grading companies, nobody's forcing you to do business with them. PSA, I'm not a customer, but I'm a fan, if I can admit that. I don't really want them to mess up. They have clear market leadership, certainly in volume right now. But when we started BGS, I really wanted to pass them up. And I still want to pass them up. But that's not because they messed up. It's because BGS or others 
innovated and worked really hard. The other thing they wanted to request from the genie is, can you bring about more standardization or consistency among these other grading companies? As a card shop owner, how do I recommend when there's too many three letter combinations to even know them all? And they're not consistent, they're not standardized. I can assure you none of them are trying to be inconsistent or away from the standard. But if PSA is the standard, they're a standard because they're trying to apply the words of what mint really means, what gem mint really means, to a difficult task of taking a card, inspecting it, and trying to come up with a number and words that describe it. I don't know how we could have done differently 25 years ago when we were contemplating BGS. We met and we thought, are we gonna be more lenient? Are we gonna be stricter? And you know what, there's no way to play that. The only thing I said in my leadership position, we cannot be more lenient. We can't be easier grading than PSA. They were the standard then. So I think we were a little bit tougher, but the marketplace figures that out. So we were taken seriously, but we were taken seriously as an alternative and not as the standard. So nothing wrong with having a standard. I hope PSA continues to do well. Okay, the other thing they wanted the genie to fix is more transparency. Maybe the genie could automatically disclose for everybody to know the print runs and production of all the products that are out there. You as digital retailers and card shop owners, you're having customers come in and say, what should I buy? And if you knew that this product produced twice as much as this other product, production quantity is twice as much and the price wasn't twice as much, you'd think, well, maybe that's a good deal. But be careful what you wish for. You already have serial numbers, you have pop reports, and you have pack odds. And from that, you or your customers can do the math. It's not simple math, but it's not impossible to figure out that this product is not as readily available and not produced in, in as much as a, every year. It seems like the card companies print a little bit more. Don't know if that'll be the case next year, but Fanatics certainly would like to print more cards and sell more cards. Turn the clock back 33 years, 1989 upper deck baseball cards. There were more than a billion of those printed, which means there were more than a million Ken Griffey Jr. rookie cards. Okay? If we had known there are a billion of these, the world would have been different, not just for upper deck, but for all of us. So I don't think it's transparency. I think we need to have honesty. On the content creation, they wanted the genie to out every content creator that had uh, ulterior motives. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, that's almost all. A lot of the content creation is in order to sell something or to promote something. I don't want to take that away. I don't think there's anything unhealthy about it. My point is expect that there could be an ulterior motive. If somebody's trying to sell you something, have more than one source of content. Very few people watch CNN and Fox. They do one or the other. But if you did both, You'd hear both sides of it. So don't have just one content creator that you listen to. Take everything with a grain of salt. With respect to Fanatics, the genie was supposed to fix Fanatics. I don't know that Fanatics needs to be fixed. I think they just need to do what they say they're going to do. They have lofty ambitions to really grow the industry. That's fabulous. If they could increase the marketing spend in this category by double or triple, without double or tripling the prices. <laughs> if they can double or triple the number of customers, and there are gonna be some increases in the prices, but we're all gonna benefit from that market expense and the increased athlete involvement they pointed out that they're doing. So I just want them to follow through with what they said they were gonna do. Finally, the concerns of the local card shop and anybody that's selling cards is, where am I gonna get my cards? In this new season of disintermediation, direct to consumer, What's the role of anybody that wants to sell a box of cards? It's gonna be tricky. I believe you need to increase your visibility locally as well as digitally. You need to demonstrate to anybody that wants to know that you have loyal, repeat customers, whether that's online or in your store. And if that doesn't speak to the card companies, then they're not listening. You need to show them you have what it takes. I've got a podcast and I'm really enjoying it. It's making me think I'm not so retired. <laughs> One more thing. I got some shout outs here and I really appreciate that, but 
you know, Mike Jasperson. I knew his dad. He's the same age as Ted. And Ray, what does that make me? I'm not old, but I'm older. But your dad was an icon in the industry. And I'm not saying I hired you because of your dad, but it sure was a good start there. When Mike Jasperson was hired, he was not a card guy. We hired for character. We'd take the best athlete available and then find a position for him. Same thing with Tracy Hackler. Tracy's talking about five jobs. The first time I hired Tracy, he had zero jobs. He was raw material, fabulous potential that's come to fruition in these five stops he's had. And I'm just proud to say I've had great teammates that have made me look good. You just mentioned a little bit about these car companies. The majority of these type of manufacturers are selling the product on their own websites before it hits the distributors and then it comes to the stores, which means it's going to highly limit the amount of product we receive. And by the time we receive it, the value is a lot higher than what they sold it for. So how can we fix that or limit that? Because like, after all, the amount that star shops all over North America sell, it's a lot higher than what they sell on the websites, right? Then why not limit that or give the card shops a chance to recover their money? Every product Panini produces, it hits their websites before it hits a store. I'm not the genie. <laughs> and there are representatives from all the card companies here. One of the things that's exciting about most of the companies in this industry being private is that they're not required to have quarterly earnings reports, but they still shouldn't fall into short-term earnings. It's good business to get money sooner, but if you abuse that, especially with what I think are their best customers, the card shops, and the people that are selling the boxes in the cases of cards, it's short-sighted. I think they know that deep down, and hopefully your heartfelt and well-stated position will be taken into account. But again, I'm not the genie, and uh, there are so many alternatives in this industry. I know you want to sell what people want, but there's other things out there that might be a better deal. There's a big difference between price and value. I didn't do value guides, I did price guides. The price of something is what somebody's going to pay. The value could be undervalued or it could be overvalued. If you buy it right from the get-go, you're getting it at the SRP. When it's double that, all bets are off. It may or may not be a good value. Could you compare, I guess, the change of the card shows with the corporate influence going back 20 or 30 years? Has that changed the experience of going to a card show for you? Well, that makes the Dallas card show a throwback because there's a lot less corporate presence. Shout out to Kit Young, godfather of this event. He really worked to the leagues, the Players Association, and the manufacturers to get them to come. And just getting to show up, regardless of sponsorship, was a big deal. Now we have their attention and we need to put on first-class events like this where there's an opportunity to interact. And that's not going to happen at every card show. Talking to Rob about his Burbank show, I think he'd like to have increased corporate participation, but not if it's intrusive. If it takes over most of the show, I don't see that as good. It needs to blend in. There are smart people running these companies, and they're going to get it. Supply and demand is a law, but it doesn't happen instantaneously. Many things take time to work out. Pricing anomalies, when something's overvalued and then it goes down, was well, that because it was too high before? We have to believe, even though there are no genies out there, there are smart people running these industries. This is not 90% of the industry. We want to think it is, it's not. There's a lot of mass retailers that handle a lot of product. But this is the heart of the industry. And you all know I had a heart attack 26 years ago next Thursday. This is the heart of the industry. And if the heart isn't healthy, you die. So they need to make sure the heart, which is the people selling the cards. You gotta have a lot of collectors, but the dealers are the relational connection.